My name is Louise Prophet LeBlanc. Uh, my traditional name is Tse Dana. It means beaver woman in my traditional language. I'm from the Nacho Nayakdan First Nation. This is a nation of the Yukon Territory. Relating to the Joshua Bell story, would you have stopped to listen to him in the Metro? I would like to say I, I would, but with all the, the bustle and you know, all the noise in the subway, perhaps not. Uh, but I also make it my business when people are busking, when people are playing in the subway, I like to support the arts. So I would stop and I probably would put some money in his violin case. And you know, sometimes people are not, their ear is not attuned to classical pieces, and so therefore they would just go straight by. My mother-in-law went to one of his concerts and he was playing a piece from her grandfather, Eugene Ezeyi. And uh, so, she, because she was so thrilled with him, that's how I got to know Joshua Lavelle. But perhaps I would not have recognized him in the subway with a ball cap on or whatever he had on, playing his violin, but he is uh, definitely, he's an outstanding violinist. So what do you think is art? Well, I was thinking about this question about what is art. I, I feel that art is an expression of the spirit, uh, the spirit within us. I think it's the expression of our inner intelligence and our ability to express beauty. I think it's the spirit lifter. It lifts the spirit of humanity. Do you think that art has a purpose? Yes. It's a happy maker, actually. Art is uh, sometimes when people are perhaps lonely, they can turn music on or, or reflect on certain literary pieces that they've read in the past, and that might lift them out of that space. Or in fact, they might, if they are trying to deal with issues. They might even turn towards the literary arts and write about them, either in song or in the literary form. It helps you to appreciate your place on the earth. That's how I look at it. What kind of art do you do? My primary art practice is the art of storytelling. I tell traditional stories. I tell stories from a long time ago. And I had, uh, I've had the privilege of being with many elders in the Yukon, from all the regions of the Yukon, and I'm a story keeper. These stories are shared with me, so as they're being told to me, I remember them. I remember the sentiment. I try and really locate my place or space where they are telling the story from. So I, I share these stories. But the type of art that I do is uh, is truly an expression of human story, the story of suffering, the story of joy, great joy. So there's different levels to all forms of art. And I must say that these stories that I tell, traditional stories, have not always been for a large audience. They have been for one or two people having a cup of tea and just sharing. That's the type of storytelling. That's how I was taught. Probably since the 90s, several storytellers from the First Nations community have begun to tell their stories to larger audiences. So it has really transferred itself into a performance art. And that could include a whole bunch of things. Sometimes people will um, ask to accompany me with uh, piano or instruments. So there's different ways in which you can present the story. It also is determined by the audience. Whenever I'm invited to a festival, it's always a unknown to me what story is going to be told. So I have a repertoire of about 40 stories that I can choose from, but it's the audience that pulls the story from me. I don't plan it ahead of time. And so sometimes when I'm invited to tell stories, people will say, what story are you going to tell? And I always have to say, I have no idea. <laughs> so that's, that's my process. How did you get involved in the arts that you do? Well, first of all, I love elders. 
Since I was a child, I was always surrounded by artists. So that was kind of like my theater. Living with my grandmother, and she would bring over her friends who were elderly as well, and they would share stories with each other. So that's basically how I became involved. And then later on in my life, I had children, of course, and I would share these stories with them. And there was a wonderful moment in the history in the Yukon where many of these stories then became written down by an anthropologist whose name is Julie Cruikshank. And when I first moved to the city, I realized that my children would no longer be able to associate with elders who told these stories orally. And because these were written, I decided to share these stories from that written form. And a friend of mine who was working at the CBC radio at the time, her name was Shirley Adamson, she, she said we should have these stories told on the radio. So that inspired me to really stop and take notice that these stories were dying out as the elders passed away, they took those stories with them. I saw my role as being a story keeper. So I made it my business for 15 years to make sure that all of these stories were recorded. So I was one of the co-founders of the Yukon International Storytelling Festival. And every story of all of those elders who have now passed away were recorded. And they sit in the archives and people can go and listen to them on the headsets. And some of them were filmed. We didn't have history books, but we had volumes of stories that told us from which strong people we have been created and our association with the land, our association with animals and all living things. So that's, that's basically how I got started. Where do you find the inspiration for your art? Inspiration comes primarily from the original teller. It's like when I tell the story of a person who is particularly those that have gone on or those people that are very elderly, I do it to honor them. I do it to serve them because their story was never told to a larger audience and I want people to know about them. I want them to be able to pay some homage to these people who've worked so hard all their lives. I feel that as a younger person than these older people, I have a responsibility to respond to these stories. Stories capture life lessons Stories capture moral teachings for which we can live our life by. As my grandmother used to say, she said, these stories teach us how to be more human, to be better human beings. Do you think that art, or more specifically beauty, can make the world a better place? In stories, there is this um, healing capacity. And it has to do with emotional intelligence. In the story, sometimes the story can make you laugh, sometimes it can make you cry, and sometimes it just makes you be in touch with something that you have kind of denied that's happening in your own life. So you go into the story, you are the person in the story. And so when, you, when the story is told, you walk away and, you, and then you feel strengthened, or you feel freed of something. So there is that emotional intelligence part aspect of the story. And I think to, the story also encourages others to take courage and tell their story. I have a very wonderful memory of one of my mentors. Her name is Angela Sidney. She needs to be mentioned. And she always said that. She said, should live your life like a story. So when you go, people will tell a good story about you. And I think that's important for all of us as a humanity, all the people in the world. When we leave, we should leave a mark. We should leave a story that we tried to improve this whole world. And that would be a good thing. Don't you think? Is there a difference between arts and entertainment? Oh yeah. I think arts, just for the sake of entertainment, of course it's become very commercial. With my particular art practice, 
I, I don't want it to be like that. I, I feel that it's more of a service. And so when I can share stories like going into schools and sharing stories with children to help them to get a glimpse of you know, who First Nations people are, who lived here originally and how they lived and things like that. So it's not a commercial thing for me. It's an education. So I mean, there are many art forms that you know, people want to get their records out there. They want to get their plays out there. And, and I think that's all good because artists too have to make a living. I'll show you my most favorite piece of art. Of course, this was made uh, with love. I was coming to the part of the world, like I was coming to work in Ottawa, and I would need a little case for my, my business cards. So although this is very simple, it's done on moose hide with beads. And some people might look at that and say, is that art? Yes, it is. I think that art has something to do with love. The love of your creator, who gives you the ability, who gives you a gift to be able to create. And you're just kind of like a vessel to make things to create things and make them beautiful. Even an arrangement of two flowers. Even how you, you place your cups. Everything around you can be an expression of beauty. Do you think that everybody should be an artist? Yeah, I think so. I think if they're encouraged, people need to be encouraged to be artistic. Children need to have that encouragement. Well, any child that I have worked with, you give them Anything to draw with, they'll, they'll draw. Because they don't have any of these hang-ups, oh, it won't be perfect. Well, at the beginning of anything, nothing is perfect. Yeah. What do you find to be the most challenging part about doing art? The thing about storytelling is having a venue. And so, even while I was working in, in an establishment of bureaucracy, you know, I so that I wouldn't lose the practice. It's like, you know, somebody plays piano, you have to practice. Somebody plays guitar, you have to practice. You have to use your, your talent, your gift every day. Use it or lose it, one or the other, right? So in order for me to maintain and keep my art, I told stories every day. And I would find myself just telling stories in the coffee room telling stories if we went out for a walk. Just to keep the stories alive, it really saved my life. Because I was so lonesome for my homeland. And when I tell these stories, I go home. <laughs>